I want to be the title sponsor, what's it going to cost? I think around 10 million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. <laughs> with exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we were joined by one legend of Irish cycling last week. We've got another one this week, Orla Shinawi. Hello, Richard. That was a, t- a terribly um, flattering introduction. I think it's accurate, though, Orla. I think you've earned that description <laughs> there. Orla of Sky Sports joining us this week as our special guest. Hopefully, Orla will be a semi-regular over the winter, although it depends how she gets on today, really bit of a trial before we uh, before we crack on we should we should ask Lionel where are we Lionel uh, we are in Orla's back garden <laughs> near France very near <laughs> France yeah so it's a long way from it's a long way from home for it me, really that's for isn't sure. it really isn't we're just outside London but you boys get nosebleeds coming this far so I brought my passport just in case <laughs> Right, we've got a lot to talk about. The Vuelta is uh, reaching its climax. We've just watched today's 16th stage and it was a thrilling one that sets it up very nicely for the last few stages. Uh, We'll be talking about the Tour of Britain as well. Orla's just back from the Tour of Britain where you did an interview with Bradley Wiggins and picked up other bits and pieces of gossip. But Lionel, first, uh, the weekly roundup. What's been happening in the world of cycling this week? Well, apart from the Vuelta and the Tour of Britain, um, the Tour of Alberta has been going on. There's been a bit of a shambles there overnight. Uh, last night's stage, the riders were sent off course. Uh, anyone watch that, they'll have seen that it all degenerated into... I should point out, I didn't actually watch this. I've just done my research very well. Um, and also, uh, a bit of transfer news, or a bit of team news, really. The Europe car team, Jean-René Bernardo's Europe car team, looks like it's going to be saved. Um, sponsor apparently lined up and rumours that Sylvain Chavanel or not even rumours, pretty strong indications that Sylvain Chavanel will return to the Vendée based team uh, where he spent the early part of his career, so sort of career turns full circle for Sylvain Chavanel and maybe when we talk about the Tour of Britain we can talk a bit about Mark Cavendish, we've, we haven't got Daniel Freib here to do the, the normal sort of transfer speculation but a few little uh, rumours about what Mark Cavendish is going to be doing um, not least because Bradley Wiggins told you, Orla, that Cavendish is definitely moving. If there are a few little noises in the background, by the way, we should explain that that is the youngest member of the podcast team, Eve Shinawi, who is coming up for one year old. That's right, yeah, she's nearly 11 months now. She's been on the podcast before, but she's maybe a little bit more vocal this time. We, we hope not. <laughs> yeah, pipe down there, Eve, love. Okay, listen, we've just watched the 16th stage of the Vuelta. Um, Tuesday is a rest day. Wednesday there's a time trial, and it's it's funny, isn't it? Because we talk about the Vuelta as the hilliest of the Grand Tours, as the the one that favours the climbers. But we're actually looking at a scenario now where a big time trialist, Tom Dumoulin, or somebody that we who we thought of as a time trialist, might be in pole position. He's fourth overall at one fifty one, and he might have just done enough in these mountain stages to leave himself within striking distance of the red jersey. Well, he is within striking distance of the red jersey. Uh, Quite a few of the sports directors at the Vuelta have been saying that the likes of uh, Joaquim Rodriguez and Fabio Aru would need three minutes going into Wednesday's time trial, and they don't have anything like that. 1.51. If Tom Dumoulin time trials as well as we think he can, um, or as well as we think he will, he may well be in the red jersey going into the final four stages of the race. They're not straightforward, the final four stages. There's a quite a difficult mountain stage on Saturday. But the way he's been climbing, um, the other climbers, the purer climbers, if you like, the likes of Aru, Rodriguez, who are obviously a lot more explosive, but they're not making that explosivity count, particularly on today's final stage, the, the last climb was incredibly difficult. It was the, the one where you would have expected Dumoulin to have real difficulty. Um, but he dug, I imagine, very deep and limited his losses to 30 seconds-ish. Rodriguez has looked really good the last couple of stages. He won uh, Sunday's stage. Uh, he took the red jersey in Monday's stage. Uh, he seems to have been getting better. He was my tip going into the race. I will remind you that I, I thought that he was going to ride a good a good Vuelta. Um, could finally perhaps win a Grand Tour, perhaps. I mean, he's also somebody who's there in contention now. Um, but as you say, Lionel, you would fancy Dumoulin to claim back 151 on, on Rodriguez. 
You would, and it's sort of uh, history repeating itself, isn't it? Because Rodriguez looked like he was going to win the Giro and then lost out to another big, uh, a very sort of rangy rider, Ryder Hazidal. Uh, was that 2012 mm-hmm. Giro? Really, Rodriguez climbed well enough in that Giro to win the race, lost it in the time trial. Um, very similar potential outcome here, but of course the difference is that there are still these four stages afterwards. So de Moulin, if he does take the red jersey, it doesn't mean that he's won the Vuelta. There's still quite a lot to do. Mm. And the because of the types of riders that Aru and Rodriguez in particular are, um, there's always a chance that if they really gear up on the final mountains, knowing that they've got nothing else... <laughs> Sorry, unfortunate phrase there, gearing up. If they really sort of, uh, if they really apply themselves to attacking, lifting the pace, making it very irregular for Dumoulin, who clearly rides in quite a sort of Bradley Wiggins style. Um, he's got high cadence, but it's quite a, a measured, fast pace rather than, you know, he doesn't particularly look comfortable when it's jerking up and down the, the pace. So there's still a lot of race to go. But what has been fantastic, I think we all agreed about this, was that the Vuelta, as you say, Rich, Looking at it on paper with all these huge mountain stages, particularly supposedly the hardest Grand Tour mountain stage ever, um, which turned into a bit of a uh, damp squib, really, didn't it? It was a little bit, it was a little bit too hard for real explosive fireworks. But the the thing that's been so refreshing about it is that it's offered riders of such different. Uh, physical capabilities as Aru and Rodriguez on one side and Dumoulin the chance to compete and they're looking to make their gains in very different parts of the race so it's been fascinating and still you know best part of a week to go. I think it's really exciting to see Dumoulin so close up there and the possibility of of taking the Vuelta a España I think we've spoken before about um it's it kind of suffers as a race in a way from an image problem whereby it's seen as being a, a pure climbers race and given that the, that it comes where it does in the season as well i think there th- th- those who aren't maybe hardcore cycling aficionados don't necessarily tend to tune in unless mountains really are your thing then you've got three weeks of that really and, and not an awful lot else so to be able to have a different kind of rider up there and then the possibility of the organizers as they did this year in fact and, and including the time trials and and doing that primarily for the the benefit of of Chris Froome, we understand. Um, But then them creating a course that's a little bit more rounded and a little bit more, I think, interesting to the casual bystander is is a great thing. And we've spoken a little bit about... um, the popularity or otherwise of the Vuelta. I don't know if we're going to discuss it and we've, we've all got different opinions on that, but I think that's something that can only be good in terms of bringing in the spectators and, and new viewers to it. In that sense, I mean, I've often been critical of long time trials in Grand Tours because they just tend to <coughs> enable one rider to deliver the hammer blow that then basically either neutralises the race in a lead up to the time trial because everybody, um, you know, everybody's basically waiting for it or it puts the race as it did in 2012, puts the race pretty much beyond anybody else. Bradley Wiggins was so strong in that time trial in, I think, Besançon, was it? Mm-hmm. Um, that you know He'd already been very good on the previous mountain stage, but basically that put the race beyond everyone else. Whereas here, it's, it's sort of been there as not necessarily the decisive mm-hmm. part of the race, but it's something that all of the uh, other riders are being conscious of. Um, but de Moulin has just been clinging on to the hope that if he can get to that time trial within, still within, it's giving him so much to fight for, and that is what's made it such a fascinating race so far. It's been fascinating, hasn't it? Because they talk about the benefits of being in the leader's jersey and how riders in the leader's jersey ride out of their skin, and it's been a sort of reverse grand tour because the, the, the big time trial does usually come out a week into the race. This one comes a few days from the finish. And I guess for a lot of the other, for the climbers, they don't really know how much time they need on Dumoulin. So it's it's made it really intriguing. It hasn't been that Dumoulin's built this lead and then is, is hanging on and, and the, the, the riders he's up against can kind of gauge their efforts according to, you know, chipping away at his lead. They're chipping away at a lead that doesn't exist. It's a virtual lead that he has by virtue of this time trial. It, it, it's been really fascinating to watch. And the other point that you made, Richard, um, really interesting, I hadn't really thought of it until you said it while we were watching the stage, is that the dynamic is interesting because it isn't just Aru against de Moulin or Rodriguez against de Moulin. It's Aru and Rodriguez on the one side and de Moulin on the other. And you could say, well, why don't Aru and Rodriguez go all out it's because they're also worried about each other. So if Aru goes too far into the red, he runs the risk of, OK, he might gain enough time on Dumoulin, but fall 
a foul of a counter-attack from Rodriguez. So you've got that. That's why it's so finely balanced. It isn't just about de Moulin's time-trialling ability frightening the climbers. It's that the climbers have got to watch each other as well as work out whether de Moulin's got enough time. And the other thing that to bear in mind is in the time trial, it's always possible that de Moulin won't do the mm. ride we're expecting because of how deep he's had to go in the mountains. So uh, usually the, the um, time trial stages of the Grand Tours tend to be a good opportunity for an afternoon nap in the Bernie household. Um, and then, I, then I, I wake up, wipe the drool from my, from my face and um, rewind the television to look at the results. Um, that's a, perhaps a little bit too, too much of a revelation of what goes on. I'm a very professional cycling journalist, honestly. But this time it will be one of those ones where I just hope they really get the, the TV coverage of it right so we get an accurate idea of who is doing what on the road because they're so close on the GC they're all going to be on the road together within you know a couple of K of each other having those time gaps is going to really make or break the sort of viewing experience so that, that information is going to be critical isn't it to the experience of watching it uh, and then you've got uh, Dumoulin going ahead of Rodriguez obviously uh, which is going to you know and, and the other guys I mean it's an interesting point about the the climbers watching these stages which have been very hard um, steep climbs they neutralise the race in a way because it's incredibly hard to judge your effort on these climbs and you know Aru, Rodriguez, Quintana Nairo Quintana who for most people was a favourite going to the race but he's now three minutes back he's, he's not going to win the race he's been ill apparently and I think they've all been a bit scared of him, you know. I think that's been a factor as well. But it's very hard for all these guys. And only the last couple of days we've seen Rodriguez really let rip. But the difficulty for them has been, as you say, Lionel, just knowing what, just how much you can expend. And that's the problem as well. Whenever you have climbs, so many climbs that are so difficult, or at least you're being told that they're so difficult, it encourages defensive riding really because you're wanting to save yourself for that next climb, for that next climb, and you don't want to blow up and have nothing in reserve for the next day. And that's not the kind of racing that anyone wants to see. I'm sure for the riders themselves, it's not necessarily what how you, how you want to win any Grand Tour. And I do. I like that spice of uh, a time trial at this stage in the race. That's not, as you say, so long that you need to be borrowing one of Eve's bibs on the sofa, because it, it does mean that it's enough to inject a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of um, something extra into the mix, without it being decisive. And I don't think anybody really wants to see a Grand Tour with one decisive stage, unless it turns out to be that in an unexpected way, as we all love. But I, I don't really like it whenever you see a Grand Tour route unveiled and you think, oh, that's where it's going to be decided. I much prefer to see a route that leaves everything up in the air a little bit because that means that the riders then are sort of gauging from each other as well as to how they're going to be racing it. Um, so I don't, yeah, I think having a, a time trial at this stage is good and I, I don't like having too many of the, the climbs that encourage defensive racing too much together. Great professionalism from Orla there just to carry on with her train of thought while her baby is screaming <laughs> beneath her feet. Uh, very impressive. Professionalism or bad mothering. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, neglect or... or, or no. She's uh, happy now. Happy She's enough now. Um, I was going to say the, uh, the hardest Grand Tour stage ever, which is how it was dubbed by some, did basically turn out into that kind of defensive battle because n I suspect nobody really knew... Um, just how hard those final climbs were going to be and there was just there was an awful lot of climbing that day I mean they they went straight up right from the start Chris Froome of course crashed early on on a kind of a fairly benign looking but fast downhill right hand um, sweeping bend smashed his foot on a wooden um, sort of Arnco barrier um, rode the rest of the stage lost about eight minutes found out later at hospital that he fractured his foot you know that was a pretty amazing ride to get through that stage in so much pain when he got off the bike he was hobbling couldn't really put any weight on his foot but that stage didn't really tell us a great deal it just kept everybody bunched together but it was de Moulin's performance that was so extraordinary that day and I think that was the moment when we thought this guy has really got a chance to win it but the 16th stage um, which we've just watched was won by Frank Schleck and Although there was defensive riding, because the time gap was so big, 10 minutes between the Schleck group and the, and the favourites, or if you want to look at it another way, Frank Schleck was riding in 2006 and the group of favourites were riding in 2015. Um, there was enough to watch, enough intrigue. The race at the head of the race was entertaining. And also, it gave you a 10-minute head start 
you got one opportunity to see exactly what the road was like 10 minutes ahead of when the favourites were coming. So in that sense, um, you saw Frank Schleck, how much, how far over the front of the bike he was, how much that gradient bit. And I know everybody um, was thinking, you know, is this 25 or 30%? very difficult to see on the tv the slope of the road but you can tell from the body shape of the riders just how steep that was that was a absolutely brutal um incline and then you could work out who was going to do what or you could guess who was going to do what on which bit of road and it didn't surprise me that rodriguez went on the second from last part that was extremely steep and aru just waited and he went hard on the the last really steep bit just to close that gap um, so that was very smart riding by Aru who we did think at one point looked at in a little bit of difficulty De Moulin just rode you know, in a bubble and we talked to Sean Kelly a bit about this last week over lunch about how hard it is to just stop thinking about the race that's going on around you worrying about the time that you might be losing to riders who are going away from you and just stick in your own zone he could very easily have pushed it too hard at the wrong point, gone into the red and, and could have lost a minute in you know, 800, 900 metres, but didn't, limited it, and he's in with a great shout. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast in association with British Eurosport. Thank you to British Eurosport, the home of cycling, who sponsor the cycling podcast. You can watch the Tour of Britain live with Rob Hatch and Matt Stevens, and of course, the Vuelta a España is also live on British Eurosport. That's with Carlton Kirby and Sean Kelly, friend of the podcast, Sean Kelly. Now, Lionel, on the eve of the Tour of Britain, you went off for a little jolly, didn't you? I did, yeah. I'm, well, we all got invited, Richard, but you and Daniel couldn't make it. Daniel is uh, doing his own tour of Berlin at the moment. Um, I was busy. Yeah, and you were busy? I'm very busy. Yeah. Um, In demand. Yeah. Well, I took, I took a day out of my busy schedule <laughs> to go down to the New Forest for the Garmin ride out. Um, Garmin have been doing this for quite a few years now. Uh, um, obviously to promote their products to the cycling industry uh, they get the Cannondale Garmin team over the Madison Genesis team are also there to ride a roughly 50 mile route through very pleasant New Forest countryside um, and I yeah, was invited down there and um, rolled out in a group which contained one Cannondale Garmin rider uh, didn't really catch who it was because he was quite a bit ahead of me and uh, <laughs> couldn't I did try and catch him up but they were pressing on a bit um, so we, we we decided to let them go um, but before the ride I bumped into Charlie Wigalius the sports director of the Cannondale Garmin team and because we were there um, surrounded by Garmins which are the handlebar computers that tell you all you know how fast you're going what gradient you're riding up, how much power you're putting through the pedals, all that kind of thing. Uh, we had a bit of a reminisce about the old days of the handlebar computers um, when we remembered the, the, the very first ones that we both had, the Avocet 30. And I'll post a picture of my Avocet 30 on the Cycling Podcast Twitter feed, if I remember. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. So, Charlie, we're both of a certain age. I think I'm a bit older than you, but um, we... Certain age, that's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, well, my best days are certainly behind me. Mine, I think you've still... Too. yeah. No, agree, I think, yeah, you, I think yeah. you've, still got, uh, you've yeah. still got some years left. Yeah. But we remember when the first cycling computers came along. We were just talking uh, a few minutes ago about the Avocet 30, which yeah. was the first cycling computer that I had. Um, I believe you had one as well, is that right? Yeah, I did. I had a, an Avocet 30, it was lime green, which fits quite well with nowadays Cannondale colours, but uh, I was very fond of it. And the thing about the Avocet 30 was it, it, it basically gave you, as a, as a young cyclist as you were at the time, yeah. a way to measure your rides, uh, work out your average speed... Um, but really, when you think back to those early um, cycling computers, and we're talking the late 80s, perhaps early 90s here, yeah. they probably had the sort of capacity of a Casio calculator, really, didn't they? Yeah, they were incredibly basic. Um, and there was wires and things that would, you know, get caught up in your tyres and your wheels and things. And I can remember that, I think in those days, it was the sign of a really good mechanic that would show a real attention to detail, you know, and send the wire along the the fork and up the, the brake housing in a really sort of unobtrusive way. 
So uh, I think there was quite an art to that that's been lost. (laughs) Were you like me? You'd look in the cycling magazines and, like you say, if you could tape the cable really in a straight line up the forks and then wrap it round in a spiral round the brake cable and then up so it was hidden. That was basically, like you say, that was the mark of a, you know, an amateur professional, if you like. Yeah, I think alongside, you know, efficient and and well done bar taping that was a really good uh, sign of attention to detail in those days there's quite a a bamboozling array of features now that Mm. that you can have is there a danger that um, you know there's almost too much information available do you have to kind of uh, monitor how the riders use this information is there a lot of guidance from the team when it comes to you know getting the best out of the equipment they've got honestly I, I think this is something that sports at this level is still exploring and still at quite an early stage because you know only only a few years ago uh you know having power data available on every bike for every rider wasn't a possibility you know only a few years ago these were things that riders had to buy on their own budget and not every rider had them so i think that cycling cycling trainers and the riders are still in a phase at the moment where they're kind of enjoying collecting massive amounts of data and the way I see it going soon is that people are going to have to work out more what to do with all that data because it's one thing collecting it and it's another thing having you know data that you can actually take action on so I think at the moment cycling in general is a little bit like a, a kid with a new toy we're still playing with it and we're still working out what to do with it and you know what soon I think we need to start to work out what we need to set aside because you can't bury yourself in the data. Sure and do you think in terms of how that data is used the teams and the riders that gain that next little jump that next little edge in performance will be the ones that use the data smartest or and discover a way to use that data because at the moment like you say you know the the perception is that it's it's used just in terms of conditioning and getting ready for a particular objective but there must be much more to it than that. Yeah, I think, you know, on the one hand, there's probably more that we could do with it. But I think often, you know, less is more also. So the key is going to be working out, you know, what's the pertinent information in all this, really. And lastly, just on today's ride, um, the Tour of Britain team are here riding with a lot of uh, members of the public, invited guests, uh, people who are connected to various sponsors that are part of the Garmin um, setup and the Garmin ride out. Um, what's a day like this uh, like for your riders? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a, for them, a 50 mile sort of easy ish day, a couple of days out from the Tour of Britain, probably not very different from what they would be doing anyway. Mm. I think, you know, for, for these guys, uh contact with uh, everyday cyclists is a really refreshing thing for them I think compared to most top sports they have more contact with the public than they usually do but events like this are nice for them because you know I mean they come off the bus on a, on a race day and they meet members of the public but they've really got things on their mind and uh, a day like today they can really just spend time with people without you know, having to go to sign on and go and ride a stage of the Tour de France a few minutes later. So I think it's nice for the people to meet them in a kind of stress-free environment and, you know, to talk to them when they're on their bikes and so on. And, you know, every time they come to these things, you know, the riders come away and they really enjoy it because at the end of the day, they're just cyclists like everybody else. They just happen to go faster than most people. So for them to spend a day with fans just, you know, in a sort of stress-free environment is really good fun. You say stress-free for the riders, less so for me. I'm <laughs> riding. There's been a couple of high-profile incidents with motorcyclists knocking off riders in the Vuelta yeah. uh, in the last week. I really don't want to find myself at the centre of some yeah. uh, massive story, big storm, idiot brings down defending tour champion. So I'm going to steer away from Dylan Van Baal, keep my distance, a right. good safe yeah. three or four metres, give myself a bit of braking space around the riders. Yeah, I think the best thing to do would be to just uh, remember back to when you did your first club run and remember the rules that you were given then, you know, about holding your line and keeping your fingers on the brakes and stuff. But I'm, I'm sure you'll do fine. And getting dropped after eight miles. Yeah. <laughs> did you get pushed home? Because I, I did from my first club run. So I, I've got a funny feeling my dad may have come and picked me up. But uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a Mars bar. <laughs> so uh, if you get in trouble, you can, that'll get you home. Thanks, Charlie. No worries. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. 
So that was Charlie Regalius of the Cannondale Garmin team. I was talking to him at the start of the Garmin ride out. He didn't actually ride the event, but uh, but I did. I took my new bike down to the New Forest. It's got the Shimano Di2 electric gears. You just a lot of a lot of names of come. Are we getting sponsored by any of these people? No, I purchased this bike with my own my own actual money. About the Di2 anyway, so I think it's fair enough to drop that in. Lots of people asking me. I have no idea what they're talking about, but um, well, applying a bit of business sense here. Lionel. Are Maybe you we should appealing for sponsorship. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Actually, we've got news on that, or that'll be coming next oh. week. We've got we have we have a new sponsor. <laughs> we have a sponsor for the winter months. That'll keep you in podcasting yeah. for the winter. Yeah. Uh, very exciting, very interesting, very innovative partnership we're 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 carving out with a company, and we will announce that next week. Potentially humiliating partnership <laughs> for the for the pair of us, Richard. Uh, more will be revealed next week. But yeah, Shimano Di2. It's Oops. basically an electronic gear system for those who are unaware. You it, uh, instead of having cables connecting the gear um, shifters to the derailleurs and the front mech that change the gears, you just press a button and it's done by magic. I think. Um, <laughs> just well, on the so you thought, well, <laughs> or so you thought. So, so uh, just as an aside, if Shimano do want to chip in for my very expensive bike, then uh, just uh, just get in touch and I'll give you my PayPal account details. Cycling podcast at Outlook.com. <laughs> anyway, um, so I turned up with my uh, riding companion and friend who also runs a bike shop, and uh, I'd uh, gone off to the loo. I came back, and he was sort of shaking his head in a comical fashion, and I thought he was winding me up. But he said, your Shimano Di2 battery has run down and is on the verge of conking out. You may not get round you've got probably an hour's worth of um changing left does so, you not realize how how rapid you are on the bike one hour surely you could do it in half that time a, a 50 mile ride in well, in, in half yeah. an hour <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you know i'm not vincenzo nibali here i didn't have a car to hold on to anyway so i'd run my battery down and everybody uh, was laughing at me, quite rightly, because I am basically inept when it comes to anything mechanical, even just changing or charging a battery. But fortunately, the Madison Genesis team mechanic came to our rescue, lent us a charger, which we managed to hook up using some other bit of equipment to the cigarette lighter on my car. We charged the battery up enough, and I managed to get round the ride. So you did actually have the assistance of a car after all. I, d- I did, mm. I did. <laughs> Sticky cigarette lighter or something. Well, that leads, that's a nice segue into, I think, talking about the Tour of Britain, because that happened in Britain, yeah. and you were riding your bike in Britain, and the Tour of Britain is a bike race that happens in Britain. Seamless. Orla, you were up for the presentation in stage one. Yes, what, I was. What did you discover? What did I discover? Um, well, I guess the main thing was a rather amusing interview with Sir Bradley Wiggins, where he let... Um, The colour out of the bag and a number of issues. First of all, that he's hoping to ride the World Championships on the track with Mark Cavendish in London. uh, The The Madison, Madison, yeah. Indeed. And that uh, he seemed to have confirmed to me as well what we all suspected to be the case, and that 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 Mark Cavendish is... Uh, preparing to leave Essex Quick Step at the end of this season. So, um, yeah, he gave me those little tidbits in a live interview, and I have to say, it was classic vintage Cav- uh, not Cavendish, sorry, uh, Wiggins um, on show that day. That was after stage one, where Team Wiggins had a fourth place finish with Owen Dill. Um and he was he was just deliriously happy. By the looks of things, I think delirious is the word. He's demob happy, really, and and I mean, it's funny. He he rode pretty well. I think he ha- he led out Owen Dool, who was fourth on the stage. A very good, very good performance by him. And he made an interesting point. I thought that you know, in 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 that team that he's in now, Team Wiggins, that was they were cock a hoop at, yeah. at that. Whereas at Team Sky, that would have been a disappointment. And and maybe he just enjoys it's a sort of liberating feeling being part of a team where they can celebrate minor successes like that. I think very much so. It's like an unbridled Brad these days. I think the fact that his name is on the team for a start, he knows he's his own boss, really. He doesn't have to follow any, anyone else's orders, which was always a big problem he had at Team Sky. Um, following the discipline and dancing to someone else's tune, I think he is relishing this... Um, perhaps self-created image of the team being a gang of uh, misfits 
he, sort of, he loves he loves the idea of himself as an outsider, doesn't he? I said the, and the, and this is this is the, the great Bradley Wiggins paradox. You know, the, the the knight of the realm, Britain's first Tour de France winner, multiple Olympic gold medal winner. He loves the idea of himself as a as an outsider. Discuss. Well, he does, um, but it's a kind of conventional conformist idea of being an outsider isn't it he i think there's a sense that he's always wanted to belong but then once he belongs he wants to be completely apart from things again you know he's he's he is the ultimate kid who's too cool for school um and it, that that goes through everything the the choice of the team that's in his image is in his image mm-hmm. isn't it it's a sort of we've talked about the the, the decision to sort of appropriate segments carefully selected segments of british cycling's heritage and turning them into kind of um, brand brad if you like it's not necessarily a criticism but it's it it looks it's not as uh, it's not as kind of carefree and kind of um you know or or as original or original as as perhaps he he thinks or people think it is but having said that you know he has created an identity whether you particularly like that identity or not it is very striking and of course they rode the first stage of the tour of britain in tom simpson um celebratory jerseys or yeah basically celebrating 50 years since tom simpson won the world championships again that's a that's by choosing to commemorate or celebrate tom simpson that divides people as well. There's not even, you know, you can't gain consensus on that because of um, the fact, you know, Tom Simpson died and, and drugs were involved and, and all the rest of that. So there's, as you say, there is a complete paradox whenever you start thinking and, uh, you know, if you if you concentrate on Bradley Wiggins too long, your eyes start to cross <laughs> over because you just can't work out this sort of mass of contradictions. I think the thing with um, Simpson, and he's got a well-documented... Um, I think adoration of the legend of, of Tom Simpson, but um, that appropriation of him and his history and his legend on the first stage of the Tour of Britain, okay, it was um, the anniversary was timely, but I think it's quite a deliberate um, way for him to hark back to the pre golden days of British cycling and pre Team Sky and, and say that his the foundations of his team and the foundations of his success are. Um, more rooted in the deeper culture of British cycling and yes we've had this new shiny behemoth coming along ever since uh, since yeah. then rather yeah. um, and he likes to say you know like when I, whenever I was waiting for him um, to do the interview it really struck me I'd just been on board the Team Sky bus and you know the the Death Star and how fantastically well equipped that was and I think he really loved being back in a, a basic camper van and, and going back to the days when that was a, a I suppose elegant, luxurious form of transport for any British cyclist, and he likes to say that he came before all of that, even if it's just in spirit. I think the word you're looking for is authenticity. That's what he's yeah, looking for. He's yeah. looking for authenticity. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, Lionel, when you when you zoom in on all these different aspects, these facets of Bradley Wiggins' character, but I'm a bit reminded. You know, it, it started, I suppose, a few years ago when he adopted the Paul Weller look. Um, you know, sometimes I'm sure you're the same. We're of a certain vintage where we go to concerts by you know pop musicians of the 80s and so on Morrissey I'm going to see Morrissey in a couple of weeks I've been to Mor- a few Morrissey concerts and you go to a Morrissey concert and you see all these guys who still think they look like Morrissey who've got the quiff and the sideburns on. they're in their 40s and they all think they're being authentic and they all think they're being very original and the irony is of course they're surrounded by other lookalikes and it, it's kind of they're you know it's kind of it's, it's kind of strange rebel, really, isn't conformist it? rebel brilliant that could be a t-shirt <laughs> but, for the conformist rebels amongst you, yeah. <laughs> but he's not the first, to, you know. I mean, cycling is a vehicle to promote brands, and and you know, I'm sure the people who make the jersey were delighted to be associated with Tom Simpson's World Championship win. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a victory of an era. It's something that, you know, when when Mark Cavendish won the Worlds, it was a real moment because you realise just how long ago it was yeah. since Great Britain had its only other previous world champion but you know they're not the only people to sort of get a dispensation to wear a a crazy jersey or a different jersey I mean I remember being at the tour in 99 and Mario Cipollini and his Seiko team were they wanted to start they did start in a kind of white and gold 
strip to commemorate, I think, the birth of Caesar, was it? Something like that. And, and, and Mario Cipollini not came in. Not enough of that. There's not enough of that. <laughs> Mario Cipollini came in on a, on a sort of, you know, almost dressed as Caesar with a with a big chariot of some description. Now There really isn't I, enough I, of that. I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember that correctly. I yeah, do you do remember that correctly. I was going to just say, I'm finally on, on Wiggins, because this was supposed to be discussed about the yeah, Tour of Britain. Yeah. But, you know, Lorna's interview is very, it's worth watching. It's very entertaining. And he is, he does look very relaxed yeah. and happy. But, of course, the ultimate irony is that he, he was, he, he, he made some, pointed remarks about Brailsford he did a little impression yeah. of Dave Brailsford and, and Team Sky and you know sort of distancing himself from Team Sky the team without whom he would not have won absolutely, the Tour de France you know he owes, a, he owes it all to Team and, and, Sky and also it's quite funny because he he does portray himself as being this rebel and um, he doesn't need any of the corporate side of things and he talked about the dictatorship of Team Sky but he was very careful in that in that interview and it was live and um, he was careful um, a number of times to correct himself when he said Sky correct himself to say Team Sky because of course Sky still sponsor his his current team so he was very careful not to annoy his current sponsor so for all the talk of or all the bravado I guess of of being his own man and and riding his own race and beating his own drum and whatnot. Um, Sky is still paying for the drum, aren't they? Sky is that, Orla? Sky, Sky. <laughs> God, this is the product placement episode. Yeah, it is, isn't it? If Sky wants to send us any money, you know, then uh, it, Richard, you made the point. I'm happy to buy, boys. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> you say about this was supposed to be a Tour of Britain segment, but in a way, that's what is so fascinating about the Tour of Britain because when Mark Cavendish and Bradley Wiggins are there. They are. They stand above it, head and shoulders, don't they? And once the racing got underway, we see, you know, I mean, I was quite interested to see Connor Dunn of the Anne Post team get in the break, an Irish um, lad, but brought up uh, very close to me. I think I've actually raced against him at Hillingdon when he was about seventeen or eighteen. Who won? Um, well, it's a bunch finish, uh, Orla. Um, I would have won. to look at the results um, to see whether Connor Dunn finished convincingly ahead of me. As a 17-year-old. Yeah, as a 17-year-old. Oh, have you seen 17-year-olds these days? You wouldn't want to bump into them. In the... I think he was eight at the time. Yeah, he was. He's a very, very tall lad, very strong, powerful. Um, got in the break. You know, Christian House in the break on the first day. You know, the kind of quintessential tour of Britain was unfolding. And then we had... A really interesting sprint finish between um, the, the the sort of yesterday, today, and tomorrow of bunch sprinting. And I'm not going to say who is who there, um, but Greipel, Cavendish, and Elia Viviani. Um, I think it's you're right in saying that when we get sidetracked, I guess talking about the Tour of Britain by talking about Bradley Wiggins and how Wiggins and Cavendish are the big draws. I was really interested this year to see. Um, much fewer people there than I've seen in the last couple of years and it just struck me that we're at a bit of a crossroads at the moment in British cycling whereby um, since I've been covering the sport um, it, it's been growing exponentially and you guys have been in it for quite a bit longer but all I've seen really is growth year after year after year and, and popularity getting bigger and bigger but when I look back to it was 2013 and um, the final stage of the Tour of Britain we were in London on Westminster Bridge and um I remember Mark Cavendish coming out of the, as it was, the Omega Pharma Quickset bus and getting up on the roof of the bus like he was a rock star. And the, the crowds went crazy for it. And there were two girls, two teenage girls, who managed to get his autograph and they were screaming, I'll never wash this pen. And they may know, I don't know why anyone would need to wash a pen, but they were acting as though it was, you know, One Direction or whatever. The cool kids listen to these days are not so cool. But, um, you it just felt so far from that this year. There were very few people at the um, team presentation uh, for the sprint finish. Yeah, there, there were decent crowds, but not the crowds that we've seen in the last couple of years. And we have been sports in Britain, obviously, with the Olympics, with Tour de France champions, with the, the Grand Depart. Um, and I just wonder what's going to happen next and where we're going to see it go next. Will it sort of tail off with the changing of the guard now? And I think the fact that, you know, the most British, the most recent rather British Tour de France winner, Chris Froome, yeah. doesn't ride the Tour of Britain yeah. is telling, is it telling of the race? Is it telling of whether he feels he needs the British um, support? I'm not sure. But the fact that he's not there, I think, takes away from it slightly cause, because he does race under a British flag. Um, and I just thought, I wonder, are we at a crossroads right now? Will we see the same kinds of crowds in the next couple of years that we've seen in the last few years? I'm not so sure. Well, this will be Wigan's final Tour of Britain. Mm. Pretty sure of that. Um, Mark Cavendish, has, you know, he's ridden it pretty much every year. He's consistently there. Um, 
we were going to talk about his likely location because he's definitely moving. He, Wiggins confirmed that to you, Orla, in your, in your entertaining interview with him. Um, we think he's going to MTN Quebec and taking a new sponsor with him, don't we? Well, we do. We do think that. Um, I mean, Brian Smith was saying recently, very recently, that obviously they would love to take Cavendish, but it's all about the funding and whether or not Cavendish and his entourage could bring a sponsor and enough money with them effectively to cover the cost because MTN itself is, is changing, pulling out. Um, so the team, although its future is secure, it isn't a team that would be able to um, you know, secure uh, Mark Cavendish at his current market value, even though perhaps that market value has dipped a bit. Although he had one Tour de France stage win, he's certainly not commanding the same sort of salary or shouldn't really if you're looking at the market shouldn't shouldn't really be in the same league as he was when he was negotiating that contract with uh, Amiga Pharma Quickstep as it was but it's interesting Cavendish I saw some quotes from him talking about the why he does a tour of Britain because it's a hard race there's sprint finishes opportunities for him and uh, it's a good sort of preparation for the world championships and we think that he will be a, one of the outsiders for the course in Richmond we think that sprinters will feature um, but perhaps wouldn't be a pure sprinters course um, but he'll certainly be in with a shout if the race pans out the right way and we've seen in the last few years of Tour of Britain being a perfect warm-up for the world championships for a number of reasons it's very rolling there's stiff hard climbs but not the long um, long mountains so it's the ideal type of racing quite heavy roads um, so it's a real good workout and um, he, but he was saying that the Vuelta has gone too far the other way 11 mountain top finishes not enough opportunities for the sprinters but I've been doing a bit of research on world tour races and how they are actually won and the great majority or not the great majority but around 35 or 40 percent of world tour races end in what you would term a bunch sprint so you know 40 plus riders so there's plenty of opportunities for sprinters this is the telegraph cycling podcast brought to you by british eurosports the home of cycling okay we're back and um, we're, we're a bit distracted this won't mean anything to most of you listening but orla is periscoping um and that that will live on the internet for 24 hours and then vanish yeah 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 so it's only uh, 24 hours only um, which is quite good, I think, because if you do a rubbish periscope, then it goes. So it's quite nice. <laughs> That's really good. Um, well, so a few people are maybe watching on that. It won't, as I say, it won't mean anything to most of you, but it's something we might re- experiment with again. Lionel said, Lionel it's doesn't, that Lionel doesn't look that. keen on that idea. We're at the cutting edge of technology, Richard, and we will embrace anything that, that <coughs> helps connect with our considerable audience. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Just <laughs> returning, mind. returning a little bit to the Tour of Britain, um, and, Cavendish's possible move to MTN Quebec and I think an announcement will be uh, forthcoming in between the end of the Tour of Britain and the World Championships having spoken to his manager Simon Bailiff on Friday one of the things that one of the things that people loved at the Tour de France I think was the, the African team now they've, they're losing their South African climber who's been riding a very good Vuelta Louis Menkes uh, to Lamprey um, will that African identity be diluted somewhat if Cavendish arrives uh, I think it, it would necessarily, um, well, fundamentally, by by virtue of the fact that its biggest named rider isn't isn't African, I think you associate an awful lot of the team with with the with the biggest rider as well as as well as the the origin of of where the team is actually from. I mean, I think that's where where Team Sky's national identity has come from so strongly. The fact that that Bradley Wiggins and Chris Froome both race under the British flag. I don't know, but that's just my opinion on it. But they'll still have African riders, won't they? I mean, Team Sky, uh, you know, Elia Viviani's won a stage of the Tour of Britain. Um, Mikel Nieve is now the, the best place rider in the Vuelta. It's an in, they're an international team. And I think the idea of, uh, you know, even even like Etics Quickstep, I mean, are they any less Belgian because Mark Cavendish has been one of their team leaders for the last few years? No, and I, I, th- I think they've managed to do... Uh, that very well and I don't know why exactly I can't put my finger on it but I think their national identity is is incredibly strong so yeah I could be wrong with MTN Quebec but um, I think they've managed that 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 strength of image because they haven't necessarily had a big international star on their on their books and that might change however from speaking to Brian Smith 
uh, at the Tour of Britain, he's, he, the ethos of the team is very much still about the, the fundraising and the charity work for Africa and, and buying the bikes for the African kids. So he'll certainly be keen to make sure that that's still a part of it. Um, so as long, I, I guess as long as they keep that charity focus at the forefront of, of what they do, then they should be able to keep it, I guess. It's all a balance, isn't it? When a team is created for whatever reason, whether it's just to sell products or in the case of MTM Quebec, to have um, a sort of much broader and charity based, not just the charity aspect of it, but also developing African cycling. Mm -hmm. There has to be a sort of pragmatic balance struck. If they stay as they are, they will just remain a small team and they will always have their you know the next Louis Menkius will just be picked off after one year or two years Um, what they need to do is is use the likes of Mark Cavendish to grow the profile attract other funding if they keep the sort of the African beating heart of the team strong then they bring the profile of African cycling up with them if they stay as they are um, then they'll just be another continental level team which will inevitably wither on the vine and, and disappear. We're assuming here that Cavendish is joining MT in Quebec. We don't know that for sure. It just seems to be the most likely candidate um, because it is likely that wherever he goes he will take a sponsor with him and, a, and an entourage. Anything else from Tour of Britain? I'm off to the Tour of Britain this week so I'm hoping to speak to one or two riders there. Maybe see friend of the podcast Tail Gagan Hart mm-hmm. who I spoke to on Friday ahead of the race. Uh, he rode extremely well last year, 15th overall, looking to build on that. And then he'll have a couple of outings for Team Sky as a stagiaire. Doesn't know yet what, what races he will ride. Teo will be looking forward to racing on his home Scottish roads, won't he? You know, uh, shortbread for dinner. And, even uh, even and though he's Irish. Andy Fenn as well. <laughs> yeah. Two Scots will really, I, I, I imagine they'll both shine on the Scottish roads. I think they brought their tartan specifically, so just to feel at home. Definitely can I'm, I'll I'll see I'll be up in Scotland so I'll see I'll see both of them there. Tail will get back on the podcast at some some point soon. Uh, I mentioned that he's a friend of the podcast. He is Orla. You're a friend of the podcast as well. You can become a friend of the podcast <laughs> at thecyclingpodcast.com. dot um, Become a friend and gain access to eight exclusive friends specials at the moment. We're adding a few more to those before the end of the year. So five pounds for the year. Not getting access to all our 2015 friends specials. Anything else? Are we? What are we expected from the Tour of Britain in the last few days, Lionel? Who's going to win it? Oh, that's impossible. The Tour of Britain is the hardest race mm. of the year to call. I mean, we haven't had a breakaway yet that's put any time um, in between. You know, nobody's really ruled in or ruled out. Uh, I imagine it will be similar to last year, um, although the course isn't quite as dynamic. I think the the Suffolk stage on the penultimate day, pretty benign. The day before that, I think goes from Nottingham to uh, from Stoke to Nottingham again. Perhaps not many opportunities there, so it's going to be decided in the Scotland uh, and the Lake District stage, and I think that will set the pattern for the rest of the week. And it will be, well, I mean, you could. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear you say who's going to win there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you could put all the names on a dartboard, blindfolded, and throw a dart, and you'd have as much chance of picking the winner of the tournament. That's how you normally do these things, is it not? <laughs> that's, that's how that's, I win um, money at betting, yeah. Uh, yeah, because Alex Dyson was pointing out just how unpredictable a race it is and was reminding me how last year he was a couple of minutes behind and then he's in the leader's jersey the next day. So it is remarkable like that. But we were talking earlier about time trials and the benefits and disadvantages um, of them. What do we think about it? Not being, there not being a time trial in this year's Tour of Britain. Is that, uh, does it make the race any the poorer or not? I think it's generally a good thing. I think in a race like the Tour of Britain it is because um, that really, although it wasn't the case the most recent occasion, but often, you know, if you've got a time trial in the Tour of Britain, when it was in Nolsey Safari Park, that basically decided the race for Bradley Wiggins. That was a real design for him so he could win the race. When it's been the little short circuit down in London, it's been pretty inconsequential anyway hasn't it really a little mountain time travel would be good i remember the yeah. 1989 tour of britain began with a a time trial up Sterling? up up you know dundee. dundee actually 1998 pro tour began with a a, a a hilly well climb up to sterling castle That's right. yeah. they're, they're they're a bit a bit different yeah maybe have like a mountain time trial on the tumble in south wales or something like that that's an idea for mick bennett to to chew over Mick, if you're listening, listen. We should wrap it up, or we're going to go over our allotted hour. As ever with you, Orla, we've you know we, we've had lots to talk about. I thought you were going to blame me there for rambling. I didn't. 
I think I you like rambled quite much. Quite concise this time. For you were quite concise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I abuse my position as a host of the cycling podcast? To, no. To plug. So that's all for. <laughs> Excellent. Go on, go uh, well, next week, Richard. I'm not sure if I'll be here for the podcast. I hope I will. If we're recording early in the week, but um, towards the end of next week, I'm cycling from Brighton to Paris with a colleague of ours, Jeremy Whittle and Pete Godding, for charity. Um, and I'm trying to raise as much money as possible. I've never done one of these charity rides before, so it's a bit of a first for me. I've been training really hard for it, hoping to set a world record for Brighton to Paris. I can attest to that. You've been feeling rather well in my mm. living room earlier, mm-hmm. stocking up on mm-hmm. the, the sugar, the, revi- the refined sugar. Chocolate biscuits yes, for, for lunch. Um, so if you would like to sponsor me, I'm talking to Periscope as well, if you'd like to sponsor me on my ride, to Paris, um, just check out my Twitter feed at Lionel Burney, L I O N E L B I R N I E, and I'll post a link on there that you can follow and donate as much as you want. 50, 100, 150 pounds. But not before you've become a friend of the podcast for a measly five pounds. Since everyone's having their say, can I just say hello to all my friends and family and anyone who might be listening since we're all having um, a, little ch- <laughs> a little chance to have a word? No. No, no that's most. <laughs> that, I don't think you're going to be invited back on the basis of that. You, that that's an abuse of your guest status. Oh, wow. Or like, Lionel's enough. earned the right to, um, to, to, to engage in that rather embarrassing sort of plea for sponsorship for his bike ride well, well you know that's me. fine it's not for me no, it's for I'm charity doing, charity I'm, I'm doing a selfless act here yeah no absolutely no it's very impressive I, I wish yeah, you good luck with that I wish you <laughs> I wish you good luck with that and that's all for this week so thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard and thank you Orla thank you very much you've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast Thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.